Welcome to Designing Hollywood Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Boutte, Jr. Designing Hollywood Podcast is dedicated to all things movies and the movie industry and its talented professionals. Today's episode is sponsored by what? Warner Brothers Costumes. Um, today's special episode is dedicated to the new anticipated film out this month, Dune. So first, I want to introduce our guest. Um, I'm going to introduce one of my friends first, which is Robert Morgan, Bob. Our first guest is Robert Morgan, and he served as a costume designer, an assistant costume designer, and has supervised a diverse range of motion pictures from fantasy, period, superhero, science fiction, war, drama, and comedy. Examples of his work include Dune, Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, X-Men, Days of Future Past, Man of Steel, Behind the Cand Candelabra, and Inception. He currently resides in Spain, and he studied fine art at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and at the University of California. And our next guest is Jacqueline West. She's an Academy Award nominee for her work on the powerful film, The Revenant. Brad Pitt, who she dressed in The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, once called West a method designer, and her work on The Revenant was no different. She immersed herself in research, visiting collections and primary uh, source materials to accurately depict the true story of fur traders and First Nations people making their way through the unforgiving frontier mountains. West goes deep into research to create looks for characters that were convincingly and atmospherically situate them in a given historical period. Without further ado, I want to introduce both Jackie and Bob to the Designing Hollywood show. Thank you, Philip. No problem. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me and thank you for being here. Um, I want to say um, we always start with the boring question. So this is a very boring question, but I want you to answer it as best you can, which is how did you come to costume design? How did you get started in this crazy, you know, design world? You go first. Say, yeah, go ahead, Bob. I would, okay. I would say ladies, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, Love, you know, I loved costumes all my life. I, uh, I started when I was a, a young kid, when uh, uh, my grandmother, we'd be locked in her house in Oklahoma during tornadoes and there was nothing to do. And my, my grandmother was an amazing tailor and seamstress and just, she never even made patterns. She just cut the fabric. And one day she said, do she want to learn how to sew? And I said, okay. And so she got out felt and pinking shears and snaps and showed me how to kind of bend fabric around bodies. And it just, even as a young boy, I was probably seven, eight years old um, and learned how to stitch and sew on a button and how to like, make something flat into something dimensional. Um, and it kind of was the beginning of that, that journey um, of my love of clothing and my love of costumes. And um, I ended up majoring in fine art, although I always loved clothing and worked in retail and managed retail for years and ended up having a clothing line um, in the early 90s in California um, for a little while um, and then found the film business and it, I ended up doing every job and started at the costume house I started American costume and um, ended up doing every job from learning how to size costumes in a costume house to pulling costumes to aging costumes, to working on set, to working as a private uh, personal uh, costumer, um, to supervising, to assisting. And then luckily uh, uh, with Jacqueline was able to costume design, which was uh, an incredible uh, and wonderful experience, not only to work with Jacqueline, but to work with Denise. So proud of you. Um... Yeah, I, I, I know Bob from my career just as a costume uh, illustrator and Bob was oftentimes my supervisor and I've also seen him do his own paintings and things like that. So I know I'm very excited for him to have had this opportunity to costume design with, Jack, with Jacqueline because it's just, uh, I'm very proud of you. <laughs> but Jacqueline, same, same question for you. How did you get to you know costume design? First, I wanna say I was very lucky to uh, have Bob with me on this. And uh, I, I feel I couldn't have done the film without him. So I just want to say that as a coda to his uh, history. Um, my mother was a fashion designer and never wanted me to go near the business. Uh, so I went to Berkeley to be a doctor. And wow. I, it was a time in, in history. <laughs> uh, 
in Berkeley where you did not want to be sitting in a science lab. You wanted to be looking at art and reading books. And um, I, to my parents' big chagrin, uh, studied art history, but there isn't much in those years you could do with art history. And when I got out of uh, school, I opened a clothing store in Berkeley that uh, later turned into a fashion line and my company got quite huge. I had my own departments in Barney's and Fred Siegel. And during that time, I because I lived in Berkeley and it was a hub of filmmakers uh, because of Tom Letty and Chez Panisse and, and because of Zoetrope and all the big maverick directors, Lucas Kaufman, uh, Spielberg, um, they all, uh, Coppola, they all hung out in Berkeley at Chez Panisse. It was a salon for, for directors. And they all shopped in my clothing store, which was next door. And um, by some turn of events, I met Phil Kaufman. And he started coming to my house and coming in my store and said, you should be in the film business. <laughs> He said, you should be a costume designer. And I said, I don't know how to do that. So it was, he hired me. I was showing my collection at the Prêt-à-Porter in Paris and he was there making Henry and June and says, you have to come and do this with me. And he called my store in Berkeley. They said, I was in Paris. He said, you come to dinner tonight. And he said, you have a job in the film business tomorrow. So for my second film in the United States, of course I wasn't in the union. He had Sean Connery call, it was a Sean Connery film and get me in the union. And so I kind of went zero to 60 in <laughs> one film. I would say. <laughs> Doing it ever since. And uh, right after Quills, which was my first nomination, I started getting all these calls from agents. Um, it was my second film and my first nomination. And so I went home from Paris and I um, we shot the end of it in, in Paris. And after, when I got home from Quills in the next morning was a Sunday morning. And I went to my store in Berkeley and put on the window, I quit, gone to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely incredible. Um, I wanna say, uh, to our listeners, because a lot of people ask this question, or we've asked a lot of people this question, one thing that you'll notice about most, um, especially but just between Bob and Jacqueline um, and what they just have said, is you can notice that the breadth of their career is in a conglomeration of just one thing. It's a bunch of different things that have all combined together and a lot of hard work. So I want to make sure that you guys know that if you do this, you need to love it. Um, but also you can see that they went through ranges of different things before they got to where they eventually are. Because I know a lot of students get really stressed out about the fact that they're like, I have to pick what I want to do for the rest of my life right now. It's like, that's just usually not how it works. She was going to be a doctor. Bob was just like, I don't know, like I like to sew. Maybe we'll just kind of try this out. And also what you need to know about Bob is Bob has done, I mean, both of them really have done every job in the department, like, you know, in terms of like doing the different jobs. So when you get to the point where you're actually the leader, it just makes sense, right? Cause now you know what everybody's doing. So I think that that's kind of a, um, a testament to where they came from, but also I just want people to kind of break through, especially in the world of social media, you get to see little pockets of people's lives, but you, you see the result, you don't see the hard work. And so I wanna make sure that you're, you're hearing what they're saying, cause they're both very humble, but there was a lot of hard work in there as well. Um, to lead up to this point, this magical point. Um, I also wanted to find out from you guys in terms of inspiration. So you're doing this huge, these huge projects now and you're inspiring people. What inspires you? Uh, art and photographs, fine art and photograph. Uh, I, I'm not a, uh, though I paint uh, as does Bob, uh, I'm not really uh, a modern art person. I'm much more of a history monger and I get most of my inspiration from uh, paintings, uh, Baroque, medieval. Uh, I have, you know, painters I just am obsessed by, by like Caravaggio. Um, I think uh, 
Giotto and Goya were the two painters, historical painters that would be filmmakers. So mm -hmm. I've always gone to them. Um, but I'm influenced also by photography. I'm married to a photographer, an ex-fashion photographer for Vogue and is an incredible eye and puts the most incredible images in front of me when I'm starting a movie. I, I got the job, The Revenant, because he showed me a picture of a medieval monk. And that's, he said, just send this to Alejandro and you'll have the job. And Alejandro kept it over his desk the entire movie. That's incredible. <laughs> We're both very visual people. And I'm also very influenced by black and white photography, Brassai, uh, Lartigue, uh, Basson. I mean, I, I love photography. I'm also influenced by fashion because of my mother. And Bob? I, I share uh, Jacqueline's love of art. Um, I, I've always looked at, at clothing and costume as moving sculpture. Um, I, I love the aspect of, of being able to walk around something or see it turn around and see how it can look so different in different lights, moving in and out of shadows. Um, and, and it is always, you know, some of my favorite artists like Frankenthaler and uh, different, different artists that Louise Nevelson, you know, that would take an all black piece and you'd see a million shades of black. Um, and, and I love that aspect of, of sculpture and, and, and clothing uh, and fashion is the layering of things and the, how not only how they look on their own, how do they look next to each other? How like Albers, how does, how does one color affect another? How does, you know, are, are you seeing what you're seeing or are you seeing a reflection of the thing next to it? Um, and, and it, it, it was the, the influence, art is the influence, um, but, but I love fashion and I do love, there were certain films I saw when I was young, like a Kurosawa film, mm -hmm. that I was just taken back and just thought, at, at first you forget you're seeing a film and then later you think, no, people made those costumes and did those things and people created that, that those frames of, of beauty of art you know each frame of that film was a frame of art and, and that was just one film uh, but that you know seeing that and then realizing that is an art form that is not it is like painting and sculpture that is another art form to paint on a screen you know to put color and clothing and texture and and you know sometimes fantastical things on human beings walking around that's you know it, it, it was very inspiring. It's been my favorite uh, part um, and joy of being in the costume department to not only collaborate and work with creatives like yourselves, but to also learn. I, I can't express to people how much I've learned just being in the department between like sculpture or uh, painters um, or um, uh, you know, not all the, the, even the technical stuff, it's all the art stuff that you guys were just talking about, where it was like, it broadened me up to where it's like, I have all these references stuck in my head now that I can just recall that I'm surprised I have just from working with different designers, right? Or different painters or photographers, or um, there's that aspect of it. And then also, um, which Jackie was talking about earlier, is it's the history. I didn't realize how much history like an actual knowledge of costume you have to have to do this job or, or, or um, of people or of places or of time periods. Um, it's like being a psychologist in a way and then trying to like put that back into your work. Um, so I appreciate what you guys are talking about for the, the inspirations that you have because it does show in your work. But I don't think that that, I think it's something that gets missed often is how much research and how much dedication goes into that specific part of like learning who those characters are. 
Um, but that's been my favorite. I think one of my favorite parts um, is just being able to go, someone will say, oh, it's like the costume like encapsulates the person. And I'm like, like Lalique? Like I can say all these different things where I'm like, how did I pull that? Like, where'd that come from? Like, I think it's like learning, but it's been one of the joys of my job. So I think it's interesting to hear where you guys pull your inspiration from. Because one thing that I've also said in this job, which is interesting is, I never try to reference things directly. I always want to find out what people were referencing. So like, if I was asking you guys questions about this, I don't want to know, like, once we see, once we see this movie, because we're going to be talking about Dune. Dune, it's got its own aesthetic. You guys have created this beautiful world of costumes and characters, right? If we're doing a film later on in history, like say three years from now, and someone wants to reference Dune, I don't want to reference what I see on the screen I'd love to ask you what you were referencing to get to the point to where you're on the screen and then continue. It's almost it's like, it's like Inception. It's like going from reference and going under the reference until you get to the base core root of it. Um, but I, I feel, I could ramble about this for all forever. I just feel inspired by your answers because that's been my favorite part about being in costume is how much I get to learn from you guys. And then also like how you take such a small idea, like a painting or something you love and how you expand it into this like other thing. It's just been really impressive. Um, so that's one of my favorite questions to ask. Um, I also wanted to find out just in general before we move on is, is there a specific genre um, that you find most enjoyable? You know, or like something that you really, you know, is there a specific genre in film or do you just find that you're inspired specific like project to project? I think it's project to project. I've always loved film noir, though, just as a as a period and as a look and a mood. But for this movie, I don't think there were any noir references except Goya. <laughs> <laughs> we called it uh, medieval because we went to the medieval. Uh, it's a world starting over, ten thousand years in the future. So. You know, we decided we had to go at least a thousand years back. <laughs> before moving <laughs> so, forward, before forward I... that, uh, you know, what would make it to the future? And uh, I think the, you know, the brutalist aesthetic that Denis referenced from the beginning definitely inspired us to simplicity. But when you look at, at Giotto or uh, you, when you look at medieval, medieval paintings, they're the clothes are quite simple. Um, and often, you know, one unit head to toe. And that inspired, I think, a lot of our, our direction for Lady, Je for Lady Jessica and the Bene Gesserits. Um, the big inspiration for the Bene Gesserits was the Marseille tarot for me, which I've always loved the tarot cards. And um, it was, we took, um, you know, from different places, but we do go to the medieval, uh, it's, it's the medieval future. And I think um, I was gonna say, one of the things that I noticed about the things that I have seen and what you're talking about is I was excited about that choice, about the brutalist kind of like simple choice because those things also, it's the secret, but they age better. Like years from now, that'll still feel relevant because it's so simple. Um, but it has a graphic quality to it that doesn't, for whatever reason, it just feels timeless. Um, and I feel like classic design really does that well. So congrats to both of you for being able to hone that in. Um, Cause these things, the designs that you guys did could have gotten really busy. They could have been all over the place, but the aesthetic that you managed to put on the screen um, for all of it just feels simplistic and classic and beautiful um, and um, helps tell the story, I think. Um, in a way where the actors can kind of shine through their clothes too, or shine through their costumes. Um, what do you think about that, Bob? Um, I, I think that's well put, actually. Um, you know, it's, a, it's unusual when you have uh, uh, a costume or a group of costumes that is already there before the actor comes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that can be intimidating a bit, but it also can be very freeing. Um, and we were, we were so joyous to see our actors come through and, and the range of sizes and 
faces and appearances from Timothy to Rebecca to Jason to, you know, the size range and all wearing this same costume um, or wearing groups of costumes that were the same. Um, and they would take that on. And it was incredible. And, and I remember Jacqueline and I, you know, we were in these fittings, putting on these like the still suit, for, for example, or the, the, uh, the uniform, the uh, Atreides uniform, and seeing how each actor would then kind of meld into it. And Timothy crawling around on the floor like a spider and doing the sand walk and Rebecca doing her fight moves and, and watching them look at themselves in the mirror and see this kind of come to life. Uh, you know, Jackie's so great. She, she would say, we're going to get wind machines and we're going to set this up. And it was, a, we, we basically created our own film in the costume department. <laughs> I think to a certain degree you have to, right? You have to like create something that they feel comfortable moving in and feel like they can act in and all of those things. But I think it also made them, it shows through in their performances, like to a degree, even with the uh, with their armor and stuff like that, that all feels, even though it's the same, but on different people, it feels different. Like they're kind of shining through a bit. I think that's kind of a cool thing. Um, you bring up the still suit. So I just want to talk about it a little bit. Talk me through that process of like kind of like creating the you know the still suit since that's like one of the classic suits in the film no i'm gonna let jacqueline start that <laughs> well um keith had done a drawing one of it's the first first costume we really worked on that we really it's where we started to dive in and he had done a drawing that Denise especially liked so it was just, he just did it on his own. Um, I think even before we came on yeah. and he um, had read the minutia descriptions in <laughs> June about the still suit. And he incorporated all those Frank Herbert notes and came up with this beautiful drawing. So we were kind of halfway there with that, to be honest, but then it had to be, able to be worn and function, look like it functioned. Mm -hmm. And for that, we went to Jose Fernandez at Ironhead and he created the first proto prototype brilliantly, brilliantly. He, he came up with this uh, idea of uh, a micro fabric micro sandwich that was all these layers of acrylics and um, uh, slight padding and netting and cotton, porous cotton, and layered them all so that it would still be form fitting to the body and create a beautiful slim fill silhouette for all of them in all these different shapes, but also look functional with regulators and tubing going through and running, you know, through the, and intri the intricacy of it was amazing. And then from that, um, Bob took it to Budapest and hired the most amazing fabricators uh, from all over to create a factory for it in our warehouse. And I'd like to mention some names. Uh, uh, David Bethel uh, was the sculptor who took the prototype and actually refined the sculpted pieces that would fit the different actors. Then we had a pattern maker, Helen Beasley, who made form, made patterns to fit each of the different actors and their stunts and whatever. It was uh, amazing. And uh, Rachel Freyer created the hood and the mouthpiece and the nose piece and the faceplate. And um, uh, it was, uh, Louis uh, Westing came from England with a, a, a bevy of, British beauties who all worked with him and uh, created the different uh, patterns for the different shapes and figured out how to join all these separate pieces together. So it was a factory. And I think we made about 250, right, Bob? 250 of those? Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. And, but each one took two weeks. So you can imagine we had an army. Wow. That is incredible. And with the Atreides armor, it had the the still suit had its own space, warehouse space, and the Atreides armor had a whole like airplane hanger uh, mm. 
to create all those various pieces before they all got assembled, you know, reproduced and assembled at, on an island, an artist community out in Budapest. <laughs> so it was a, you know, they were, uh, it takes a, this took more than a, a village, this took a city. This is um, uh, an incredible thought. In ju it's just in terms of process. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of how many jobs there are in the costume department and how much it takes to get that initial thought that you have to the camera, to the screen. Um, and then you guys can also hear that they made 250 of them. Each one took two weeks. I mean, this is an incredible amount of work and we're only talking about one, you know, one relative design. You know, that's just for that one. There's all the other stuff that you see in the movie as well. Um, so I do want to give the costume designers both their flowers for also people to understand when you go and watch this movie, just, you know, watch it and enjoy it, sit back and relax. But then also every time you see costumes on the screen, I want you to recognize how hard these two people work and how hard their teams work. Um, I think it's something, especially in lieu of what we're dealing with right now um, with the unions and stuff like that. I want people to know how hard the costume department works. It is a village, it is a tribe, it is a trial by fire. It's all of those things. Um, but hearing Jackie talk about the crew and about how many people just to get that one thing done, I just want you guys to really pay attention to that um, because it's impressive, um, but it's also a lot of work. Um, thank you for that. I would, I'd just add, I'd add this. There, there were 125, I think, Jackie, is that right? Pattern pieces in that costume, in that one costume. Yes. Um, and, and each one for each actor, each time it was, was a bespoke costume. It was each one. And, and I don't think- They were not with, cutter costumes. <laughs> and, and when we started the film, it did kind of make me laugh because um, we looked at each other when we first spoke about it and we said, you know you have 400 specialty costumes in this film. <laughs> and they kind of looked at us and we both looked at each other and went, <laughs> yep. well, you do. <laughs> so we're hiring a lot of people, yeah. <laughs> taking a lot of jobs. A lot of people, a lot of jobs and a lot of craft uh, craftsmanship, I think too. It just- We had real artists working with us. Every, right. Everybody was an artist and everybody put their whole heart and soul into it. And I think you see it on the screen. I think you see the, you know, it was a labor of love, not just people who knew and loved the book. Yeah. Denis is a, is a great leader and you want to please him. And um, he, you know, his reaction and his, his graciousness and his uh, absolute appreciation of everything. He would come walk through uh, our city, <laughs> our wardrobe city often. He would just come and look at what people were doing and making and, and praise their work. And um, Matt Reitzma created a whole art department, creating all the fabrics and the textures and the prints. Um, it was the dyeing of all the, uh, you know, maybe 40 different colors of sand to make the gauze wraps on the still suit. It was, they'd be hanging all over the, the lot on, on rack, drawing racks. You know, it was like amazing uh, effort. The Atreides armor, um, Simon Brindle was the sculptor and I thought it would never get done. He stood over that torso in, like, like he was doing the David, you know, <laughs> like Michelangelo, he stood over it with his sculpting apron, just looking at it, studying it. I thought, uh, you know, I mean, come on, you know, and then it just all, I walked in one day and thought, this is never going to happen. It was all in a box to go to the fabricator in Budapest, and, but he had a city of people working on every piece. There must have been a hundred uh, pieces in that costume. Easily. Easily. Can, you guys, can you guys break down the initial thought process or the, the, um, the conceptual side of going, you know, from kind of nothing to something with that, with the armor specifically, because it does have such a beautiful aesthetic. Like, where did you start with that? The Templars. <laughs> I just looked at a lot of Templar art and Templar armor, and we gave it to Simon. He is a true artist, sculptor, mm -hmm. and 
he was able to translate it into something that looked like the future and that wasn't uh, computer generated, that looked organic, but yet new. And I think it's the, you know, like I said, it was the world starting over. So he came up with something that looked like it hadn't been this world without computers that looked like it hadn't been computer designed like a video game. Yes. And he was very adamant. He didn't want alien spaceships or a video game look. I think when you guys talk about like, cause you, you were talking about like kind of the world starting over. I think a key thing for this film in general is that it's a massive world building exercise. Like, and that's something that we don't get to do often. Um, and when we talk about world building just for our audience, I want you guys to know when, when I say world building, I mean, true world building. You're going from something that doesn't exist and you are trying to design a world in which all of these things are happening. So you're designing a suit that regulates your body temperature and does all of these things and like uses your body fluid so you can breathe. Like that's those things, it's not like you can just like, oh, let's go to the store and buy that real quick. It's all design. So how did you guys break down thought process wise when you were starting? I'm gonna, you know, do this world building. We've got different worlds. Like how did you, what was that the initial start process for that? Was it the novels? Like how did you start? Well, Denis was our guide and it all came from the novel for Denis and he wanted it to look real. He wanted to, us to create a fantastic future that looked real. Like it really could happen. That's, that's what you feel when you read the book. Yeah. Like you feel that a, it's a natural progression from now and what we're, I mean, we're gonna need st still suits. If the temperatures keep going up and all these forest fires everywhere that are creating unbreathable air in so many places. Um, you know, it's not, it's a foreseeable future. And I think Frank Herbert scared us all, you know, back in the 60s, that this was going to be what would be the natural progression if we stole everything our, from our planet without any, any thought to the consequences, without restoring anything, or giving anything back, or recycling or regenerating or, uh, you know, being mindful of what we're doing. So he, he was very grounded in the real, Denis. Yeah. And, and in the book, he read it when he was 12 and it made an enormous, enormous impact on him. And he had a vision for this movie long before we came on and he was able to express what he wanted, what he liked and how it should look. And I think Bob and I are both really visual people and he is a good uh, conveyor of his ideas of what he likes and what he doesn't like. And um, we could watch him and when we put things in front of him, respond viscerally to things. And then we knew we had it. And if he kind of was so gracious, he would never say he didn't like something, but he, we knew we had to keep going if we didn't get that big, uh, visceral uh, approbation. There's something um, that I do want to bring up in terms of like hearing you guys talk about Denis as a collaborator is really inspiring and refreshing because from everyone that I know that has either met him or has worked with him, they say he's just lovely, he's quite collaborative and also very passionate about, you know, the filmmaking process. Um, I've worked with a few directors where I think, um, it's really inspiring to work with someone that loves film, like where you can tell they love it with every pore in their being because it spreads out to the entire crew. Um, and it seems to me in terms of, and you guys can tell me, but it just seems like he's very collaborative, which, um, which is nice to hear. Did you guys feel that way in terms of even like going back and forth costume wise with the process of like design and stuff? It was, it was probably most, the most incredible experience I've ever had in that way that, and like Jackie mentioned earlier, he would come to the costume department. He'd say, I'll just come over. I'll just come. So I, I want to see every step of the way. He says, let me see the print. Let me see the dye. Let me see the fabric. He, he just wanted to know and wanted to be involved. And even in our very first, when we very first started and um, Jackie had stayed in LA to work with, with uh, Jose at Ironhead on that. And I left to go to Budapest. And so we did these kind of pre-COVID Zoom meetings you know, before they were doing this, we were doing this, uh, Jackie in LA, I in Budapest, or I in England, and, and we were all in different places, um, because he did want to be so involved, and we would actually have Keith 
uh, Christensen on, on those Zoom calls a lot of times. Yes. Um, so that we were all hearing the same information. Um, and, and, and Jackie touched on this earlier. He, 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 we knew what it was, but we, didn't, we also knew what it wasn't. And he was very clear what it wasn't. Like Jackie said, it was not science fiction. It was not steampunk. It was not, you know, it was from history. Uh, we looked from history. And then, you know, you, when you see the costumes, we didn't have any buttons. We didn't have any zippers. We didn't have things that, that came from now, even though a lot of the costumes are based in, in history and in, in art. Did you, um, in terms of like, it just at least for my, one of my favorite costumes or my favorite characters, I have to talk to you guys about this because it's my one thing. Um, uh, the Baron. The Baron is like this larger than life character. I want you guys to just talk about like how you approached that problem, <laughs> like just in general. Well, from the very beginning when I realized that he was going to be 400 pounds. <laughs> Only thing that came to my mind, and I said this on my first meeting with Denis, which was from Mary Parent's office at Legendary, when I said the definite no is a definite maybe. And she said, well, you meet him and you will do it. So <laughs> I went to his off, I went to her office and she put me just alone in her office, Legendary, this big sprawling office. She's the head of legendary. And we had done the Revenant together and I knew and loved her and trusted her. So she said, I'm locking you in a room with him. Just, he'll win you over. So she left and he said, well, one of the first questions, he didn't ask me about the still suit or anything. He said, how do you see the Baron? And I said, well, you know, I've always been uh, obsessed with Marlon Brando. And I said, I immediately apocalypse now comes to mind, <laughs> Kurtz. And so I, we started, he said, it's brilliant, Jacqueline. Yes, yes, that's perfect, it's perfect. So we knew we were gonna have to make acres of silk for that look. Mm -hmm. you know? And that it was gonna have to be, he was gonna need suspensors to move because he's 400 pounds, but he has to be, he's, he's gluttonous, he's, um, he's uh, rapacious, he's uh, a pederast, he's, you know, everything dark, everything dark. So of course it became black and massive for, mm -hmm. so that he could rise to, you know, 50 feet in the air and there'd still be fabric. So we started composing this, you know, like I said, acres of silk mumu mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> to, to cover this massive body. And yet it had to, you know, be uh, seductive and sensual and do all of these things uh, and still, you know, be almost uh, like some, you know, big long black slug or snake, you know, but a fat one. And uh, it, so many things went into the, you know, design and then we gave it a, a print or Matt Reisma came up with a fabulous print on it, which gave it a insect feeling, which is a precursor to the other uh, Beast Raban's armor and, and later on the Baron's actual armor and the, the Harkonnen armor. Um, it became this huge insect motif because in the book, Frank Herbert, I think, um, or, or his notes, he says his mother was called the Black Widow. So we created this insect head helmet and gave all textures and designs that you see on insects, but you don't see unless you're close up. Mm -hmm. I'll be very subtle and not be busy. And evil is, is the hardest thing to dress because it can't be overarching. Mm -hmm. People have to come to terms with the evil from within the actor, from the inside out. And I think um, the simplicity of his outfit allowed Stellan, he, he fell in love with those baronial silks so much he didn't want to put his armor on at one point. <laughs> When he said, okay, now he has, we want to see him coming down the corridor in his armor. And we had to talk him into it. He, that silk thing, something about it was as portrayed his nakedness. And his nakedness was, you know, all wrapped up in his gluttony and in his, in his, you know, dark side. It's interesting that you say that because it's, it's actually my favorite thing about the character. And I feel like you guys captured it, which is, 
he feels to me when we when we see dark emperor when you think about it just as a character type right it's flashy it's grand it's operatic it's all those things right this feels like seeing the guy backstage in his most broken down stage before he goes out on stage and puts on all the stuff right but that's who the baron is it's like this like gluttonous just gross just like but that's what he wears for so it's like that silk and allowing him to just come through allowing the actor to come through that point and just play and just be gross and evil it's a, a really uh, great character choice. I think that that's a it's a it's a good balance. Um, and then also knowing how big he is, and I think there's something about that broke down nature of it, like before, like and seeing that. But that's what he presents as being like the thing um, that's super cool to me. Well, it's like Hugh Hefner in a smoking jacket, right? This yes. is a guy who never gets dressed. Yes, he doesn't have to. You know, the more naked it is, it, he is, the more it, easier to perform all of his uh, evil. Very, very cool. Um, and then the other thing that I had really quickly is I noticed in the trailer, um, there are a lot of costumes that have flow. The fabric is flowing. Can you guys talk to me about how you went through the process of figuring out all that movement? Because I think it just ends up looking, you know, incredibly beautiful, but I know that there had to have been some work involved or some thought process. So kind of walk me through some of that if you guys can. I'm doing it. Was, it. it was um, from the beginning and, and from, from Denis, um, he had an image. I think it was a, it was a, a storyboard, wasn't it Jackie, uh, of Lady Jessica. And it was a very simple drawing, but it had this amazing fabric blowing and, and he loved it. And it is so dramatic and it does show wind and does show passion and shows, you know, the element that you're in when you see those wonderful gauze blowing or silk blowing, um, it's powerful and it's visually powerful and it gets larger than life. It, and it's, it is incredibly dramatic and, um, and I think we talked about it a little bit earlier in our in our little city of costumes, our big city of costumes, we had fan we brought in fans and fabrics and and would do these uh, when we did the fitting so you could see what those the the framen looked like with their robes blowing or what Lady Jessica looked like with that beautiful you know scarf blowing. Um, it just carries such movement and such such grandeur. It's it's it, it was very inspiring. We used a lot of, I had a, a, a fabulous assistant in Los Angeles, uh, Christy Cham, and she's, uh, you know, quite the fashion person. And she found incredible fashion references of draped, draped silk and satin that we uh, could then translate into something that looked uh, like the medieval future. Uh, but a lot of the references came from fashion, from runway, from uh, couture. I used a lot of Balenciaga, which he got That's all of his. Designers. He yeah. always got a lot of his inspiration from Goya mm -hmm. and from Velasquez and the great Spanish painters and often religious, uh, you know, very nun-like some of his creations. That was something I was going to ask you too, was that the shapes and the silhouettes that you created, they feel um that's another subtle trick I feel like so you got the aesthetic of being brutalist and simple so that the costumes will remain classic right but then underneath that there's the other layer of you're talking about like Goya and the simplicity of something where first read you're like what's that that's something alien I've never seen it and then second read is like is that a, a nun a pope like there's something that grounds it to where it's just familiar eight o'clock <laughs> you know it's, it's quite ecclesiastic, I think, uh, the, some of the references. Uh, and there's a certain, the, they're often ornate ecclesiastic stuff. The shapes are quite simple. You take all the trim off. They're quite brutalistic. Like I was showing you, I was showing yeah, you please. this is, I think, just so absolutely perfect to illustrate that. You can see the, you can see the religious influence, but how it can transform into a space outfit. It's quite beautiful, the shape language. Is that Keith as well, Keith Christensen? This is Keith, yes. And this is all page 
of variations on that theme. Here's the, the top, it's quite, uh, you know, Avignon uh, papacy inspired. I looked at a lot of stuff from the Avignon papacy and then this is the translation. So it's quite, quite beautiful, the process. And as I showed you before, this is what started him off, which is very quite different and quite ornate, but we knew we had to trim it all down, but maintain those classic shapes that we're familiar with as being uh, overlord, uh, the overlordism of Catholicism. You, now, what I want you guys to do is look at the stuff that she was just showing as well and look at the fact that conceptually they took something that exists, there was a board or a mood board that kind of said like, look, here's our general view. And then from there, they spun it out into this beautiful, amazing thing. I just think that that's like, I can't get enough. It's one of my favorite things ever to just see something that we recognize. And then at the end of it, it turns into this beautiful thing where you're like, it just inspires you to think bigger. Um, and so that's something that I definitely think you guys have successfully done over the course of these costumes in general. Um, I would like to, I think, close out by asking you specifically, just in general, uh, because there were so many different moments, do you have a favorite moment or a favorite or a favorite thing that you enjoyed working on from this film? Could be anything, could be something mm -hmm. small. As, as we worked on each aspect, I think that was our favorite. <laughs> so from point to point. Immerse ourselves. I, I, for me personally, it was Peter DeVere's costume, this the black human stiletto, the mentot of the Baron. To me, that was a costume I dearly, deeply loved. <laughs> I think there's also, uh, go ahead. Well, go ahead, Bob, you tell me first. It is a tough question, and, and we've been asked this before. It's, um, and Jackie said it best, that they are, were all our favorites as we were doing them. Um, uh, I did really love, and it came later, and it was the illustration that, that Jackie was just holding up, um, uh, that costume, which was, was the unusual kind of bishop in space. <laughs> And they were the uh, facing bill. Thank you. I can't couldn't come up with the name. <laughs> this, I couldn't this, think of it this morning either. And then it just into my head. The space spacing guild. Thanks, Jackie. I was like, what is like a um, but then space we did this, Bob. <laughs> and it was like coming back to it, like <laughs> but it, it was it was a, a an unusual costume. And and you know, when we came back to do that, um, it was so based and steeped in religion, but the story is so driven by this religion. You don't see it right away, but you do, if you've read the book, you do realize that these worlds have been manipulated by the Dun Gesserit, that they have, have definitely sowed the seeds of this, their lore throughout these worlds. Um, and it was, a, it, it was one of my favorite costumes to see them coming, walking down to, from that sketch, to see them walking down the ramp Mm -hmm. um out of that ship it was like it, it gives you goosebumps now because the first day we watched it happen and it was like you know the ramp was very steep it was kind of funny because the ramp was very steep and our first ad came called me and he said do you guys want to come see how steep this ramp is <laughs> and i said yeah we should and i thought because you don't want you know you have to keep looking forward you can't be looking down at your feet wearing these costumes um but they rehearsed it and the, you know, the, the, the extras were wonderful. We actually had stuntmen doing those, those costumes, wearing those costumes, um, because you really did have to walk with purpose. And um, it, it was, gave me goosebumps you know, to watch that happen. So that, I, that was one of my favorites actually. I love this question because what happened is you both kind of came to life with little moments that were for yourself. And one thing that I think that inspires a lot of us just in terms of you guys have very storied long careers right you've done lots of really impressive things the joy that you just answered that question with means that you still have the joy too and the love of it which is really nice to see which is there's at least a moment at every given point because we do we work hard it can be stressful it can be tiring there's months on end of this hard work but the fact that you still have love for it is really uh uh it's inspiring. So thank you for that. Cause that's actually, I, it's one of my favorite things to hear is that you have, I have a high point moment. Oh, please share. 
is when Bob and I went to Paris on a weekend and hit Charlotte Rampling at her beautiful apartment in the 16th arrondissement and uh, watching her character come to life. She's quite fashionable in her own right. And she was always one of my favorite actresses, her look, the, fa the fact, you know, she was, it was one of the couples of my, uh, you know, coming of age, her and Jean-Philippe Jarre, I think she was married to the composer and getting to meet her in her own environment, this beautiful apartment in Paris and putting the Mother Mohayam costume on her with the beaded veil and the, it was, it, you know, she was so tall and magnificent. It was, uh, it was a rare moment of the movie getting to dress Charlotte Rampling for me. And in one of my also favorite costumes, those, those two, her and Peter DeVries, I, DeVries, I think are my favorites. But that moment of us um, going to her apartment and doing her first fitting and watching that, we, that, that her costume had been on a mannequin for about a week and Denis had come and seen it and everyone had been through our, our space and, and seen it and then to see it on her and watch it come alive and how she carried it and how she just became Mother Mohayam right out of the book. She just jumped off the pages of the Herbert novel for me. It was so exciting. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that because there are moments where this is one, this is another one of my favorite moments. My moments, which you're just explaining, which is when you are in the moment, because we all travel and move and work so much when you actually take in something as it's happening in real time, those are like, some of my favorite, yeah, and appreciate it. It's like, those are some of my favorite moments, I think in life. Um, I think that for me, I'll share a story with you guys quickly, which was, I think the first time I realized that I really liked costume or that I wanted to be in costume was on the Hunger Games. It was with Trish Somerville. Um, and I had done a pattern for uh, uh, Jennifer Lawrence's uh, mocking J dress. So I had been sitting there and I just was taking, photoshopping all these like Alawan peacock feathers. Like with, I learned a new peacock. There was like some special bird and did all this stuff. And I was looking at Alexander McQueen and trying to get like a weird kind of pattern. Didn't think anything of it because it's just conceptual. And, uh, and so we got the thing, it gets approved and everything. And I'm, I've long since moved on. And Jennifer Lawrence comes for a fitting and she walks out in that dress and it had the pattern that I had drawn on it. And I just, I was like, wait, like, wait, like I couldn't, it was, it was like, um, I tried to explain it to like my daughter because we were talking about food, right? She goes to the grocery store, we pick out food, we bring it home. There's no um, grounding to like, oh, this, someone grew this, or it came out of the ground, or like, it, it was a process to get it. And I think up until that point, I had approached clothing the same way. It's like, I go to the store, I buy some jeans. I didn't think about the fact that someone sat down and designed those jeans or designed that shirt. So that was the first moment where I'm like, wait, wait, that's like, that thing that was drawn, that's, that's there, it's in real life. And so that was kind of a moment where I remembered like, oh, that's cool. Like, that's a cool, that's Not a fine. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> So it was so many really gratifying jobs in this business that people, you know, don't aspire to, but when you end up in them, mm -hmm. then you really appreciate it. You really, really appreciate it. And so I'm glad that you guys have that joy um, and that you did have a, a, a fun time working on this. And you guys should be proud of the work that you did, because from what I see, it is quite beautiful. It looks like you guys translated the novel and Denise vision very well. Um, and I hope that you are happy with the results um, because you did a great job. <laughs> so I want to thank you guys uh, for coming to the show. Um, I'm going to thank our sponsor, which was our sponsor is Warner Brothers Costumes, a legacy collection of over 95 of Warner Brothers film and television costumes available to the industry, highly organized, easy to access from beginning to the end of time. Warner Brothers Costumes is a full service professional costume resource, costume manufacturing, prep offices, fitting room, Adria Dyer and millinery services. Warner Brothers Costumes is located at the Warner Brothers lot in Burbank, California. Um, and Warner Brothers costumes where characters begin. Um, I want to make sure too that we have just in terms of I don't know if you guys are big social media people. Are there is there any place that people can follow you guys or go like you have websites? You know, David Fincher said never get on. When we get <laughs> <laughs> that is a good person to follow suit from. And I never have. <laughs> uh, 
Would I, I, um, I actually, I have social media, but I, I, every year I do a, a dry January and this year I did a, a, a Facebook free February. And so I kind of signed off all social media, although I put my, I saw so I got rid of all of it, but I put my toe in once in a while because I did want to share about this film and I was so excited and proud that I did post a few things about the film on Instagram and on Facebook. And they're both under Robert Morgan art. There you uh, go. And I just wanted yeah. to make sure people know, ultimately the best thing you can do is just follow these wonderful people in real life, which is checking in and seeing what they're up to, um, as opposed to checking on them on social media, because we already talked about how that could not be the truth. The truth is in their work, in their passion and what they bring to the screen. And we should all be so happy to enjoy it. Thank you guys very much for joining us and we will see you again. Thank you, Philip. Go see the film in the theater. <laughs> Please, that's yes. Go see this film in the theater. In Please, the theater. Not sit that's, that's how Denis, at every at every Q and A we've done, he has thanked the audience for seeing it on the big screen because that's how he intended it to be seen. And I think so much of the energy of the film comes from the audience, the mm -hmm. awestruck audience, and you don't feel that in your own home. You need to be surrounded with people that are uh, immersed with you. This, so this everybody world. do what you need to do to go to the theater. <laughs> I know there is a group of concept artists. We are all renting a theater. We will be there. So please go and see this film in the theater. And thank you guys so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Thank you to our viewers. Be sure to follow Designing Hollywood Podcast on social media and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube for all of our episodes.